we were greatly encouraged, and I think one of the greatest encouragements for me was the encouragement to devote myself to prayer, meaning coming into the presence of God. Not saying a prayer, not just hearing God's voice, but coming into His presence. I don't know what happens to you when you come into the presence of God, brother, sister, but for me, it changes me every time. I can't come into God's presence and know that He's here without truly worshiping in my spirit. Where my spirit is changed because God's presence is so strong and you, you realize how holy and awesome He really is. As I walk through this world in the busyness of, week, of the week and, and, and each day, I tend to forget that. I tend to forget how mighty, awesome, and holy that God really is. Because I interact with people and I have my own thoughts and my own plans and my own busyness and it, I get distracted from the reality of who God is. I was reminded of that the last three days as we sat together in His presence. And I was greatly convicted and encouraged with this one thing. Live in his presence. In Psalm he says, live in the fear of the Lord all the day. Live in the fear of the Lord all the day. And that word fear isn't a frightened, I'm running for my life kind of fear. It's a reverential awe. Absolutely awestruck. But to be awestruck, I find the, the, only th the only thing that takes me there is when I see something that's awesome. How about you? I mean, are you awestruck right now? I, I doubt you really are. You don't look it. I'm not that awesome to look at. Thank you. Somebody knows the truth. <laughs> but when you see God, Job expressed that difference. Job was a righteous man. It doesn't tell us of any time that Job lived a sinful life and needed to repent. Perhaps he was raised in the presence of God, had godly parents, whatever his upbringing, Job feared God. That's how Job starts. Job chapter one, there was a man in the land of Uz and this man was righteous and he feared God. That means he was in all of God. And because he was in all of God, he was righteous. He lived a righteous, holy life and he deeply cared for people. He was a good dad. It tells us he got up early in the morning, every morning, and interceded for his grown children in prayer and made sacrifices to God lest they had sinned. He was righteous enough that God pointed him out to the devil and said, Hey, devil, have you noticed my servant Job who fears me? means he lives in my awesome presence. And yet, when the devil came and attacked at him, fiercely, stripping him, leaving him for nothing to wish for in this life except death, even cursing the day he was born, wishing he had never been born, he said. Yet in all of that, Job didn't sin, but when God spoke to Job and Job came into a greater revelation of God at the end of the book, Job made an amazing statement. He said, I have heard of you, God, all my life with the hearing of my ear. 
But he had missed the part of God. He said, but now my eye sees you. And it doesn't tell us in the book of Job what he's seen. What kind of revelation he had. Maybe he had a revelation like Isaiah did in Isaiah chapter 6. Where Isaiah was prophesying and speaking God's word to a righteous nation. Israel was doing really well in the first six chapters of Isaiah. Though Isaiah wasn't addressing the outward righteousness that King Uzziah had brought to Israel. And had restored temple worship. And, and there was outward righteousness going on. And Uzziah was a righteous king. Until he was lifted up in pride. And became a leper. Went into the temple and made the sacrifice of incense. Which the king was forbidden to do. Only the priesthood. And there was a particular reason for that. If you study Closely, you will understand why God was so jealous over the priesthood. There was only one man in all of the history of the universe that was ever allowed to be dual, have those dual responsibilities, to be a king and a priest. Can you guess what his name is? Notice I said, is Jesus. Jesus was to be the first man who was King and priest. Where God reconciled both offices together. And he still is our king and our priest. When Uzziah crossed that line, God smote him with leprosy. And in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah says in chapter 6 of Isaiah, I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord. And it changed him. Go back and read that. How Isaiah experienced the awesome presence of God. And you'll notice it changed who Isaiah first, who he was. Isaiah was speaking God's word to God's people. But when Isaiah saw God, a revelation of God, he said, woe is me. I am undone. I have unclean lips. But he didn't end there. God didn't leave him there. You see, when you and I see God's awesome greatness and we come into his presence, God does an amazing thing. God doesn't stay passive towards any person. Without respect to a person, God doesn't stay passive, seated, seated on his throne, looking at us and examining our life. When he sees a man or a woman drawing into his presence, James says, draw near to God and God will draw near to you. That's what God does. When we come drawing near, God comes drawing near. It's as if he comes off his throne and he comes down and he runs out to meet us like the father ran out to meet his son. He draws near. Have you experienced God that way? Job did and he completely changed his life. From a perspective of himself enduring the struggle of life. Of the persecution of Satan. Of the bad advice and condemnation of his friends. Job saw God. And he worshipped. And all of a sudden, his whole perspective changed. And when he changed, then God changed. His, his experience changed. And that's how the Lord has been speaking to me in the last three days. This Phil, you can have that hearing my voice. You can follow me in many ways. But unless you come and actually enter into my awesome presence where your eye sees how great I am. The eyes of your spirit are lifted up from earth to heaven. And you have something then be all struck by. And it'll change your life. Just like it did Job. I often think even of John. Like it did Isaiah. And I think of Apostle John in Revelation chapter 1. John was in a good place. He was, it was the Lord's day. Now some Bible scholars 
believe that John was referring to what the Roman Caesar of that day had designated as a high day, as a Lord's day, when he was to be worshipped as God. And over that time, that's why John was on the Isle of Patmos and many Christians were being severely persecuted. I don't remember if it was Caesar Nero or the one after him who had declared that there was going to be a national holiday where all men worship him. And all the people from all over the Roman Empire were supposed to come to the temple and acknowledge Caesar as Lord. And they called it the Lord's Day. And it tells us, many Bible scholars believe that John was referring, it was on that day that John didn't go and acknowledge Caesar as God. But he came into the presence of God, the Lord. And on that day, he saw the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ lifted up. And when he saw him, first he just heard him. He tells us, turn your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter 1. Let's read the story. Verse 9. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation. Notice that was his circumstance. There was great persecution. He said he's partaking in that every day. The history of the people who were shipped to the Isle of Patmos weren't just out there hanging out. It was a slave camp. It was a mine where they were sent out to work in the minefields every day. And the Romans were merciless minecrafters. They beat their slaves a lot. Drove him to hard labor. John was an old man by now. He was a fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus. Notice how he's seen it right now. I'm a fellow partaker with the rest of you. And there's great tri uh, tribulation. We're part of another kingdom. And we're persevering. That was the spirit, the mentality he had. He was on the island called Patmos, Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see. Notice he didn't say, write in the book what you hear. Write in a book what you see. And what John seen changed John's message and our Bible. And send it to the seven churches. To Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Now notice what John did. And I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed in a robe reaching to the feet, and girded across his breast with a golden girdle. And his head and his hair were white like wool, like snow. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. And his feet were like burnished bronze. And when it caused to glow, when it has been caused to glow in the furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. And in his right hand he held seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead man. But Jesus didn't leave him there. And he laid his right hand upon me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. And I was dead and behold, look, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of hell. Write, therefore, the things 
which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which shall take place after this. I found myself in my Christian life too often discouraged because I lived with the things I heard rather than the God that I saw. And dear brother, sister, it doesn't matter if you're in Job's circumstance, Isaiah's circumstance, where he thought he was a righteous prophet preaching to a wayward Israel. Or if you're in John's circumstance, in a world of deep suffering and persecution and onslaught of the enemy on your soul. And you're hanging in by the sheer grit of your last strength. It seemed like that's how John was. He found himself just barely. I can imagine this old man being wore down, ready to die, going to the mines, working hard, being whipped, and seeing his brothers and sisters being tortured and whipped and dying in this mine, and being almost at the end of his life, thinking, I can't hardly do this anymore, Lord. Just take me home. And so he was in the, in the spirit, worshiping the Lord until he saw the Lord. And when he saw him, it changed his attitude towards the world he lived in. And not ever after that again did he mention his circumstance. But it was a word of encouragement, a word of life, a word of eternity. And one of the great truths that Carrie and I heard sermon after sermon all day long for three days was this, this l truth of living with eternity on my heart. Living as if this is your last day. Living in, in the glorious truth that Jesus could return today. What are you going to do about it? Is this the way you want him to come into your life today? With your attitude, what you're looking at, with your busyness, with your labors. Are you willing to follow these men and be transformed because your vision is changed? From your earthly things, looking at people and hearing about God or even hearing his voice, your eyes are lifted up. As Jesus said, when you hear of all these things, lift up your eyes. He didn't say, listen with your ear. He said, lift up your eyes. Your Redeemer's drawing near. In James chapter 1, I spoke last Sunday as the Lord was sharing with me in regards to these words of being, verse 19, being quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. This you know, my beloved brethren, but let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness in humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. But don't, don't only receive it. Prove yourself doers of the word not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently. The word is, the root word of intentional. You're looking into the word of God for a reason, for a purpose, intentionally. And the word intently is, it, it has the meaning of 
someone who's studying the skies and the stars and they're looking into the microscope or into the telescope because they want to see the glory that's out there. They're searching for something. And they keep looking and the longer you look, the more you see. And perhaps it'll happen to us with that old riddle that you may have heard as a child. The wise old bird sat in an oak. The more he saw, the less he spoke. The less he spoke, the more he heard. Why can't I be like that wise old bird? But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it. Not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. Not just a doer, a doer that is effectual, is effective. That means your doing is affecting others. It's not just doing for yourself. It's more than you. It's bigger than you and me. Your doing is effective. God's effect upon others' lives. Having become a, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man shall be blessed in what he does. And that's what Jesus said after he gave the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and in Luke chapter 6. Remember the, the illustration that the Lord said? If you hear my words and you do them, your life will be like a person who digs deep and builds on a foundation. And his house, his life, because it's built on a foundation, when the storms come, Jesus said, when the floods come, that means there's a flood coming. Now you and I both know that for a house to stand in the middle of flood waters, it takes a lot of good, solid building. Yeah, it must be well built or it will just wash away. Even houses that are well built tend to wash away. But Jesus said, if you will hear his words and do them, your house will not wash away when the floods come and the winds blow. But the person who hears them and doesn't do them, he also has a house. You build a life, a good life. Listen to good things. You might go to church all your life. You might be like a Job or even like a John. Look at John and all these men, they also did. But there was an element that they had been missing of Jesus. John had known Jesus in a very close intimate way as he walked on the earth before he was the glorified Christ. John was filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. In fact, it seemed that he was closer to Jesus than Peter and many of the others. It refers to him in John Chapter 19, 20, and 21 is the one whom Jesus loved, had a close relationship with. And John spoke more about the love of God than all the other apostles put together. And yet, when John saw the glorified Jesus in the midst of his great persecution and struggle of life, it transformed him. He had a change of perspective. And the Lord made him an effectual doer. He wrote. He was told to write, and he wrote. And it's affecting you right now. It's affecting me. An effectual doer. If anyone thinks himself to be religious, and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Worth zero. You can add many zeros to your life. You'll still remain a zero. Worthless. But if you add the words of Jesus Christ in obedience, a heart of obedient faith to your life, you won't be worthless. No matter how worthless you feel, you'll be an effectual doer. No matter if it's in a little way or a big way. This is pure an undefiled religion. This is it. In the sight of God, 
and Father, of our God and Father, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. This morning I will look at three examples of obedience. Three examples of obedience. The first one I would like to look at is recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 13. 1 Samuel chapter 13. And here we see the story of King Saul. Now you know the story, probably have read it many times. But I want you to come to it with this heart intentionally this morning. And look deeply into Saul's life and how the Lord has recorded his life for you and I. With that intent, the intent that the Holy Spirit wrote this story. Receive that intent and let the Holy Spirit plant it into your heart. In chapter 13, we see that Saul was 40 years, 40 years old when he began to reign. He was, again, a Benjamite. Saul was not a wicked man. He was a righteous man. He was attempting to serve the Lord the best he could. God, in seeing his heart and now giving him a responsibility of being a king over Israel, wanted to bring a test to his life. Wanted to take Saul and transform his life by testing his heart. And that's still how God does to you and I. Not because we're sinning. Not because we've done something wrong that has displeased God. Because you're righteous. And God has a mission and a work for you to do. God will bring a test into your life. And many times it's this test. Saul, wanting to kind of establish himself, went and attacked the Philistines. And the Philistines were like, oh yeah? He stirred up a hornet's nest, as we say. It tells us, actually, Jonathan did it. Saul's son, in verse 3. And Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba. And a garrison was a group of soldiers that was stationed in an outpost. And he went and killed them. And the Philistines heard it. So Saul, he blows the trumpet, blew the trumpet throughout the land saying, let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard the news that Saul had smitten the garrison of the Philistines and also that Israel had become odious to the Philistines. The people were then summoned to Saul at Gilgal. Now the Philistines assembled to fight with Israel. 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen. And people like the sand which is on the seashore. That's a lot of people. This huge army in abundance. And they came up and camped in Michmash, east of Bethlehem. When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait. For the people were hard pressed. Then the people, this is Saul's army, hid themselves. They were running. Hiding themselves in caves. In thickets. In cliffs. In cellars. And in pits. Also some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan into the land of Gad and Gilead. But as for Saul, he was still in Gilgal and all the people followed him trembling. Had a little group left and they were very, very afraid. Have you ever done this in your life? You know the Lord has appointed you for a work. And so you go for it. You reach out into somebody's life. Perhaps you've heard the words of Jesus very strongly in your life. Come unto me. Follow me. And I will make you a fisher of men. And you say, yes, Lord. I'm going to go tell this person. I'm going to go share the gospel with these people. I'm going to do something for you that you know God is calling you to do. And oh boy. The whole host of hell gets inflamed against you. And all of a sudden you sense that Satan and all of his demons are coming against you. And there is a great army against you. And you feel it. And there's fear and there's intimidation and there's all of the emotions these people were experiencing. You're feeling at this moment. 
Your self-confidence of verse 3 is all of a sudden gone. Yeah, you killed the garrisons, but you killed a little group. But you, you Mission accomplished, but now there's war declared on you. And you know it. And your heart fills with fear. And many around you are fleeing. And the Lord says, wait for me. Wait for me. Wait on the Lord. Perhaps you've heard those words in Psalm 27. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. Wait. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Be of good courage and do nothing. Wait. Do you wait? Have you been here? Have you been in this test that God gave to Saul? I have many times, brother, sister. And I've heard those words every time. Wait. Just wait. Don't say anything. Don't do anything. Just wait. And Saul had been told to wait, verse 8, seven days. Now Saul waited seven days according to the appointed time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, I'm done waiting. I've waited seven days. Samuel hasn't come. I'm going to die for sure. Put yourself in this situation. There is many, many people around you who have one intention and that is to kill you. They're not going to leave you alive. Saul would be the first one dead here. His life was marked and the Philistines were out to kill him. There were 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and a multitude, which I don't know if it was a million man army, doesn't say the sands by the seashore. They couldn't count them. Don't be too hard on Saul unless you've waited every time. Saul panicked. Bring to me the burnt offering and the peace offerings, and he offered the burnt offering. And it came about as soon as he finished offering the burnt offering that behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him. And greet him. Hey, Samuel. Praise the Lord. Glad you came. We just got done offering the sacrifice. You don't see that Saul was even convicted of his sin. He didn't. He didn't think he had done anything wrong. Samuel didn't show up when he said he was supposed to come. So who was going to do it? Saul. But Samuel said, what have you done? Oh, maybe he did know that it wasn't right. He just was pretending there was nothing wrong. And Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the appointed days. That the Philistines were assembling at Michmash. Therefore I said, now the Philistines will come down against me in Gilgal. I have not asked the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. Forever is a long time. That's the promise he gave to David. And David is still in that promise. You and I are still serving the son of David, Jesus, the king of kings. His kingdom has no end. But now your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has appointed him as a ruler over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Then Samuel rose and went up to Gilgal to Gibeah Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people who were present with him, about 600 people. Now it's going to be an interesting story. I don't have time for this morning, but go back and read that story. Who delivered Israel that day? Do you know? Who delivered it? Jonathan and his armor bearer. He started it, he finished it, he delivered Israel. 
But Saul went on to do many foolish things by telling the people they shouldn't eat because he was still panicked with fear. Saul remained Saul, filled with fear. And God couldn't even use him to win the victory. He had to use Jonathan to win a victory for Israel that day. It got worse for Saul. Saul wasn't willing to wait on the Lord, but took matters in his own hands. And later, God gave him another test. This time, it was a clear, instructive word, go do. First, it was wait. And I've seen something here. If I'm not willing to pass that first test with God, when God says, just wait on me and allow God to first purify in me a humble trust, a humble trust, a submitted trusting in him with my life. Then God brings another test and says, go, go accomplish my will. Go perhaps speak my word. Go do something for me. But if I'm not obedient, if I haven't learned that obedient lesson, and the saddest thing to me is that you can't read that Saul repented anywhere. There's no repentance written that Saul seen his own sin and repented from it. And so God said, okay, Saul, now go again. Go destroy the Amalekites in chapter 15. And there was a particular reason the Amalekites had come up against Israel when they were coming out of Egypt and had fought against them. And God said, now this is it. My anger's through with them. Wipe them off the face of the earth. Kill them all. And he gave Saul a clear duty to do. And Saul went out. But in, eight, in verse 9, But Saul and the people spared Agag, the king, and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatling, the lambs, and all that was good, were not willing to destroy them utterly, but only everything despised and worthless they utterly destroyed. And Samuel comes. Now notice this. What happened to Saul? This is the point. Look what happened to him. Verse 10. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I regret that I have made Saul king. For he has turned back from following me. Now God's regret wasn't just, it won't be passed down to his children. Now he regrets that he's king. This becomes now personal between God and Saul. But Saul didn't see that, nor did he acknowledge it. I regret that I made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not carried out my commands. And Samuel was distressed and cried out to the Lord all night. And Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul. And it was told Saul, Samuel saying, Saul came to Carmel and behold, he set up a monument for himself. Interesting. Jonathan wins his first major battle. And Saul goes after the Amalekites in obedience to God's word, but takes glory to himself. He's there busy making a monument for himself. You see what was in his heart? And Samuel came to Saul, verse 13, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord, Samuel! I have carried out the command of the Lord. You see what happened to him? He was deceived. James chapter one became true in Saul's life. He heard the word of the Lord, but he disobeyed. He wouldn't wait. Heard the word of the Lord again and didn't fully obey. Mostly, Changed it up a little bit. Oh, what, what does it hurt? I think this is a little better. We'll save all the best animals for sacrifice to God. He wasn't taking them to himself. He took them for sacrifice, he said. Oh, and the king? I don't know. Maybe Saul and Agag were friends. It doesn't tell us why in the world he spared his life. But he did. But Saul now came to Samuel confidently, 
I've done God's will. And Samuel says, what then is the bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen? Verse 17, is it not true that when you were little in your own eyes, you were made the head of the tribes of Israel and the Lord anointed you king over Israel? Verse 19, why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord, but rushed upon the spoil and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord? Now that's not how Saul seen it at all. But God seen it as evil. It was just a little disobedience. He had mostly done it. Just kept a little back. Then Saul said to Samuel, I did obey the voice of the Lord. And went on the mission on which the Lord sent me. And have brought back Agag, the king of Amalek. And have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people, the people. Oh, I see. People did it. The people took some of the spoil, sheep and oxen, and the choices of things devoted to destruction to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, look, look, child of God, to obey is better and sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams for rebellion. What? I didn't rebel. Samuel said that was the people. I did obey mostly. A rebellion is as the sin of divination. You know why it's as a sin of divination? Divination deceives you. Divination fools you. Into thinking you're hearing God's voice when it's not God's voice at all. It's the voice of the devil meant for your destruction. That's why rebellion. He didn't even see it as rebellion. He had already been deceived by it. Insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. You might as well have went and served another God, Saul. He has also rejected you from being king. And Saul says, okay, okay, okay. I get it. Verse 25. I feared the people, verse 24, and I listened to their voice. I transgressed. I know I did it. But please pardon my sin and return and worship the Lord with me. Do you know why he wanted to worship the Lord? Read on. Verse 30. Then he said, I have sinned, but please honor me before the elders of my people, before Israel, and go back with me that I may worship the Lord. He had made it a monument already for himself. And now he was worried about the honor of men. First thing I see in Saul's life is fearful impatience. Fearful impatience. And I ask you, dear brother, sister, look at your life. When you're tested in your life, not when everything's going well and panic really does set in and there's good reason for it. Will you wait on the Lord or will you be fearfully and out of that impatience for God act? Secondly, it made Saul a rebel against God. That's what happened in his heart. But it fooled him, deceived him. Partial obedience, obedience is where it led him to. Partial obedience. And that was enough for him. He was satisfied with that. And he thought God should be too. And thirdly, it led him to the fear of man. Controlled by people. Oh, it was the people. Blaming the people. And if you continue to go down through Saul's life, you'll notice that something happened to Saul. There was a time when the Holy Spirit left him and he remained an angry person until the day of his death, the last day before he died. Guess how low he went? You know the story? He went to see a witch. A divination. That's where he resorted to. That was in his heart right from the start. But he didn't recognize it. I don't think he would have dreamed 
that at the age of 73 years old, that's where he'd end up when he was 40. Started through small acts of disobedience, incompletion of fulfilling God's whole word to his life. Consoling himself. He did okay because he did most of it. The Saul syndrome. The second one I want to look at is Jonah. The prophet Jonah. Now Jonah is an interesting man. And if you haven't read the book of Jonah lately, I encourage you to do it. Jonah was not a Saul. Jonah was a servant of God. It tells us in 2 Kings 14 verse 25, you can read 2 Kings 14 verse 25 through those next few verses. It's the first time we read of Jonah. He was a prophet in Israel and he was a very interesting prophet. He prophesied up towards Galilee in the northern kingdom. And it was right after Elisha's, sometime between after Elisha's death and the prophet of Isaiah. The, where Isaiah was prophesying. And it tells us that God used Jonah to prophesy to Israel. Now Israel was very wicked at that time. And Jeroboam, not the son of Nebat, the first one, but the second king came up, wicked king, didn't repent from his wickedness, but he established Israel. And Jerob, uh, uh, Jonah prophesied to Israel. And you know what God prophesied through Jonah to Israel? That he's going to bless Israel. Even in their wickedness, even in their sin, no one repented in Israel. The king didn't repent, but God had mercy on Israel. It says, for his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God just blessed them. It was a season of great blessing on wicked Israel. Now, coming to the book of Jonah, God had another word for Jonah. Go to another wicked city, your enemy, the Assyrians that had come and had taken Israel captive many times. Go prophesy against that city. And you know the story. Jonah said, I'm not going. And he runs from God. And God takes a disobedient prophet and converts souls. First act of disobedience. An amazing thing that God did. Jonah goes into the ship, and you can read this. I don't have time to read through it. Chapter 1. But the end of chapter 1 is this. Verse um, 16. Then the men of the ship feared the Lord greatly, and they offered sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. The shipmen were converted to God. Just a few verses before that in the storm, they were crying out to all their own gods. But God became, the God of the Hebrews became the God of these shipmen through a disobedient prophet. Because Jonah wasn't messing around. He knew who God, how God had acted to Israel. He had prophesied and God had blessed. He wasn't going to do that again. But God changed his mind. And in chapter 2, Jonah repented and he goes to Nineveh. Now it tells us that Nineveh was a city of a three days journey. A big city of over 120 souls, the Lord says. A great city. Now a three days journey, Jesus referred to in one of the gospels as one day as a 12 hour day. He said, don't you know there are 12 hours in the day? So think of a, a 12 hour day's walk three times. How far can you walk in 12 hours? Well, we had a little snapshot of this yesterday coming down 85 from Cheyenne to Alt. I pressed in the GPS a little east of Alt and it said 12 hours. And I looked at my GPS. I was like, you've you got to be kidding me. Not 12 hours. And here it was on the walk sign. You know, your GPS has walk and drive and bus transit. It was on the walk. Oh, it's going to take us. So I told the boys, it would take us 12 hours to walk to Alt. That's a day's journey. In the Bible times, it would take you three 12 hour days to walk through this great city. That's how big it was. Jonah starts and he comes to the city and he starts proclaiming that God is going to bring judgment on their wickedness. And he didn't even end the first day. You'll notice that. 
in chapter 3. Nineveh, verse 3, was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days in Nineveh will be overthrown. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God. They called a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. And the word reached the king of Nineveh. He lays aside, rose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth and sat on ashes. And he issued a proclamation and it said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water. But both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth. And let men call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we shall not perish. When God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Jonah never even made it through the city, only a third of the way through. Great revival. You would think this prophet of God was a happy man. But it greatly displeased Jonah and he became angry. Chapter 4. And he prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said? See, he was arguing with God while I was still in my own country. Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness, and one relents concerning calamity. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life, for death is better to me than life. And the Lord said, do you have good reason to be angry? Jonah, you can read the story, as far as we know, died a bitter man prophet of the Lord who had prophesied and God had blessed who had prophesied and God brought a great repentance according to history Nineveh lasted for another a hundred years 100 years from that great revival he was an effectual doer don't you think Saul through his disobedience, failed to enter the kingdom. Failed to enter into that place that God had appointed for him in Israel. But it didn't destroy Israel. God rose up another man, King David. Jonah, through unbelief, pride and arrogance, brought great repentance to a wicked heathen city, but yet missed the salvation of the Lord in his own life through unbelief. He obeyed, but only through like coercion, God forcing him to. He had a fear of God, but not a fear that led to repentance. They both missed God's salvation in their own personal lives. God still used them. The third one I want to look at is Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul, you can read in the book of Acts. We know his story, right? How he started persecuting the church. And I want to just read a few verses to you to show you Paul's state, his attitude towards Christians. Chapter 8 of Acts 1. And Saul was in hearty agreement with putting Stephen to death. And on that day, a great persecution rose against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And some devout men buried Stephen and made loud limitation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women and would put them to prison. That went on for some time. Chapter 9, verse 1. Now Saul, still breathing threats 
and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. So you can see what he was doing. His attitude, breathing threats and murder against God's people. This was a madman. And then he met the Lord. Verse 3, and it came about that as he journeyed, he was approaching Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but rise and enter the city and it shall be told you what you must do. And the men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. And Saul got up from the ground. And though his eyes were open, he couldn't see nothing. He could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, neither ate nor drank. In verse 15, the Lord tells Ananias, but the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and sons, the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Verse 18, and immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and he regained his sight and he arose and was baptized and he took food and was strengthened. Now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue saying, he's the son of God. Transformed life immediately. But quickly persecution came and the Lord loved Saul and changed him to Paul. And it doesn't tell us clearly in the scripture, but from the best that scholars believe, it was about 10 years that Saul was shipped back to his hometown and stayed there for about 10 years. And later, Barnabas goes to find him and brings him to Antioch. For 10 years, the Lord took Saul and put him into, made him a disciple. Now, he was transformed. He was preaching the word. But perhaps with the same spirit and zeal, it had just shifted. It was... As he had said in Philippians, he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was the best of the Pharisees, a zealot. And all that zeal had just transferred now over to Jesus. Perhaps the Lord knew this man was going to do a lot of damage to my kingdom. And bring on even much greater persecution. I need to temper him for 10 years. Make him a nothing, a nobody. We don't know what he did in Tarsus. But he went home. And God was silent over his life for 10 years. But I believe the word of Isaiah 49 was fulfilled in Paul's life over that time. And I'll tell you why I believe that. In Isaiah, actually chapter 50, verse 4. Isaiah is saying this, or the Lord is. The Lord God has given me the tongue of disciples. That means a tongue of discipline. Is your tongue a tongue of a disciple? That I may know how to sustain the weary one with a word. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. Look what happened. I gave my back to those who strike me and my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. For the Lord God helps me, therefore I am not disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like a flint and I know that I shall not be ashamed. And you can continue to read through. But I believe that that's where Paul was discipled. Learn to hear God, see God, have revelations of God. That really formed him into the apostle that he was. And here's why I believe it. Paul's testimony in Galatians chapter 1 says this. He said in verse 9. As we have said before, so say I again now. If any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you, that which you have received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Am I striving to please men? 
If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bond servant of Christ. For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. But when he who had set me apart, even from my mother's womb, and called me through his grace was pleased to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer or consult with flesh and blood. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him for 15 days. But I did not see any of the apostles other. I did not see any other of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. That's Paul's testimony. And then he went back again to Tarsus, to Arabia, until Barnabas came to pick him up and bring him to Antioch. You see, Paul not only had a Damascus Road experience, a one-time experience with God, but that ushered him into a life of discipleship. And what I see in Paul is what I see absent in Saul. Saul was not willing to wait for God. Paul also was full of zeal, ambition, immediately wanted to preach Jesus. But God had to temper that ambition and make him a real true listening disciple until Paul was willing to simply follow the Lord out of obedience instead of out of personal zeal and ambition. And it changed Paul's life. We know the rest of the story, right? And I could continue to just go through the scriptures, but later on in the book of Acts, after Paul was imprisoned and he stood before I think it's in chapter 16. He stood before King Agrippa. He relates this story to the king. And King Agrippa was the King Herod of the Jews. And he said to King Agrippa, I know that you're not ignorant of all that's been going on in Judea for the last 30 years or so, whatever it was. So I happily testify. But he gave this testimony. He said, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. That revelation that he received from the Lord, he obeyed. He became an obedient follower. And so I challenge you with those three examples that the Lord has given to us. Are you a Saul in some ways in your life? Are those areas there where God tests you and you give a halfway obedience, a reluctant obedience? And don't be surprised if the Lord confronts you like Samuel did Saul and says, that's rebellion. That's rebellion in your life. God was trying to save Saul. Saul didn't see it. And he died a rebel. And the kingdom was taken from him. Or God may use you as a Jonah. You may have the repentance of Jonah. Okay, God, I get it. I get it. I've been running away from you. I've said, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm coming to do it. I'll go do it. And God can use you that way. But unless you yourself enter into that compassionate heart of God and you minister to others from your heart of compassion, you allow the Lord to put his grace in your heart and give you all the heart of God to the people you minister to, you'll die a Jonah. Preaching the gospel People may repent at the word you preach, but you yourself will walk away angry and bitter towards God. Or you can follow Paul as he followed Christ. Be a zealot. But in your zeal, realize you're wrong. And the Lord Jesus confronts you and you have repentance. But in that repentance, when God through circumstances... By the way, Paul didn't volunteer to go home. 
the church sent him back. You can read that in Acts chapter 9. There was great persecution. And the church said, you're going home, young man. Get out of here. It's not good for you right now or good for us. The church sends him out home. And Paul submitted to that. Paul learned something that Saul and Jonah completely missed. Something of the compassion of God, but also he embraced suffering as a part of God's love in his life. And he didn't run away from the suffering. He fulfilled Isaiah 50. I was, my ear was discipled and I didn't turn away my face from the suffering that that brought on my life. I embraced it. 